as we start surveying more and more with RTK and we leave our total stations behind in the truck, I think it's really important to understand what your receiver is doing and how you're deriving that RTK equation. So in this video, I'm gonna explain what your receiver is doing with the information the satellites are sending, how it is computing an RTK solution, and what that means for you in the field. So to understand how your receiver is calculating its position, we gotta understand what the satellites are telling us. So what is happening before anything reaches your receiver is the satellite is beaming down information to the Earth. What is contained on that beam is what allows you to calculate your position. So that beam is made up of several different parts. There's the carrier frequency, which is the frequency at which the satellite emits its information. So think of it like your radio frequency on your base receiver, or when you're tuning into the radio on your car, that channel that you're tuning into, it's the same idea for a satellite. It contains all the information and the receiver knows to look for it. So think of it as the base unit that we're using. Then there's the pseudo random noise constant, and this is the unique sequence that distinguishes satellites from one another. So there's a number of different constellations up in the atmosphere. There's GPS, there's GLONASS, there's Galileo, there's Beidou, there's a variety of regional ones, but they're all sending information and they have to identify themselves. So that's what the pseudo random code is doing. Then there's different modulation techniques. So this, you know, includes, you know, L1, L2, different ways to get through canopy, through trees, buildings, that kind of thing. Things to make it easier for your receiver to calculate its position on the ground. And then contained in these signals are various different data messages. So this includes information about where the satellite's positioned above the earth. It contains information like the clock, because all GPS satellites are at the end of the day are very accurate clocks. So it includes that kind of information. It includes system status on the health of the satellite. All of this is going to be used by your receiver to calculate its position. And then finally, based on our satellite and our various constellations, we're gonna have a variety of these different signals put out. So we've got L1, L2, L5, all of those different ones are going to be on different frequency bands that our receiver is going to use and put together into its final solution. So now that we understand what is contained in the signals that the satellites are putting out, we need to understand what our receiver is doing. So pretty much anything that has a GNSS chip inside of it, whether it be your phone, the GPS on your car, or an RTK receiver, is going to calculate their position in the same manner. What is happening is, as these signals arrive on our phone, whatever device it may be, your phone is going to decode that information and it's going to strip out all of the information it needs. So it's going to figure out how far each satellite is, where that satellite is positioned in orbit, whether there's any error correction that needs to happen. If you have an advanced receiver, you may even have things like ionospheric modeling to try to correct for that and make your position more accurate. And once all that information is decoded, the receiver is going to triangulate its position. So it's gonna say, okay, if receiver A is over there and satellite B is over here and satellite C is over here, I can triangulate where all those signals are intersecting and get my position. Now, if we were in the military, we'd be able to get that to within a couple centimeters. But for anybody else in the civilian world that doesn't have access to that, we're gonna have a position that's accurate to within a meter, 30 centimeters on a really good day. But for most consumer devices, we're gonna have a meter to five meters of accuracy on our position. So now with RTK, it gets a bit more complicated because instead of just having one receiver that we're trying to calculate a position on, we wanna correct that half meter position down to a centimeter. So to do that, we're gonna use two receivers. We're gonna have a base receiver and we're gonna have a rover receiver. So that can be in the form of a network for our base or a local UHF base station. But in principle, what is happening is we're going to be broadcasting corrections from the base to the rover and those corrections are gonna help us tighten up our position. What does that mean in practice is a bit more complicated. So I'm gonna throw up on screen here a graphic. With RTK, as I mentioned, it's a lot more complicated than calculating an autonomous position. And that's because we're really gonna be focusing on the carrier wave. We're gonna measure the cycles on the carrier. So with any wavelength, we have a cycle between each peak on said wave. In the case of our L1 signal, it's 19 centimeters. And if we know that information, we can calculate the range to the satellite based on the number of cycles it takes for the signal to arrive at our receiver. By measuring that at the base and the rover, we can correct for a centimeter accurate position using our inter-ambiguity search problem. With RDK, as I said, it gets a little more complicated. And that's because, yes, we have all this information on the signal, to, but to get our centimeter accurate position, we actually need to focus on the carrier wave of the signals from our satellites. And that's because each wave has a cycle, right? We have a wavelength that these are being broadcast on, which means we know how long that signal is, and we know the number of cycles it takes to reach us from the satellite. So with that information, we can measure it both the base and the rover. And by comparing the two, we can solve our inter-ambiguity search problem. 
By solving that equation, we can achieve centimeter level precision relative between the base and the rover. And that's the important part. When we're talking about a relative position, we have precision down to the centimeter level that is relative to our base and rover. So if our base has that half meter offset that I mentioned earlier, because it is just solving an autonomous position, we're only gonna be accurate relative to our rover. And that's why we need to do things like localizations or set up our base over a known point. Now, that is a very general overview of how the RTK equation works, but what you probably care a bit more about is what it can be used for. So, you know, we're a shop here that sells surveying equipment, so quite obviously we can use RTK in surveying. So we've got base and rover setups, there's network rover setups, you can do all sorts of applications, whether it be boundary surveys, maybe laying out a train line, setting utility poles, setting fences, doing topographic surveys. In construction, it's very commonly used for machine control nowadays as we're moving more and more away from laser-based machine control. We're even starting to see it on autonomous vehicles, whether it be some of the cars driving around. There's robots that have it now. It's being integrated with LiDAR and drones. There's a number of applications that are RTK is becoming more and more prevalent for. But for now, that is everything in today's video. And if you want to get a more detailed overview of what the RTK equation is actually doing and how it's solved, I'm going to link to some resources down below because to be frank, it's well above my pay grade to explain exactly how that stuff works to you. But if you have any questions about anything you've seen in today's video or any questions about anything you've seen on this YouTube channel, don't hesitate to reach out. Give us a call at the number below on the screen. Shoot us an email, visit our website, check it out. We're here to help you out.